three friendly, 00558, additional group, 00563, running north. Target now, 17646, tracking uh, 260. Forget Shark Week. Here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, it's Bomber Month. On the 4th, 14th, and 24th of December, we'll feature a different bomber topic from the Cold War era General Dynamics FB-111 to the consolidated B-24 Liberator and strategic bomber flight tests. Never mind the announcements. Listener questions can wait. Let's get straight to it with your host, former U.S. Air Force F-16 pilot Trevor Boswell. Hey everyone, it's Boat, and I'm interrupting the start of this final installment of Bomber Month 2021 for a couple of quick announcements before we get to the grand finale. First up, I wanted to pass along a big thank you to our guest host, Primetime, for taking the reins on the first couple of episodes for Bomber Month this year. It's definitely not easy conducting interviews, as I think I've probably stated a few times here and there, and I think he did a great job of focusing on the technical aspects of the FB-111A and bomber fly test. A lot of cool information in there. So primetime, great job, and we look forward to what the future brings. Now, I've been fortunate to interact with a bunch of guests these last, man, I guess now 14 months, crazy, and I'm still messing things up on a regular basis, and the only reason it sounds anywhere near as good as it does is due to our editor and producer, Bernie. So Bernie, thanks for all your help with making all of us, and specifically me, somewhat presentable for the audience. And for my final announcement, you may remember from our Attack on Pearl Harbor bonus episode earlier this month that our friends over at Detail and Scale Aviation Publication offered up three copies of our subject book, Attack on Pearl Harbor, Japan Awakens a Sleeping Giant. Well, we wanted to congratulate our three winners, and so in no particular order, James Fader, John Roberts, and Jason Poole, by way of your way too cool wife, Hillary, congratulations. We've already been in contact with each of you, so I hope you guys enjoy that amazing book. And for everyone else that entered but didn't win, something tells me there are a few more giveaways coming up in the future, so don't you worry, you'll get your chance. That's it for announcements. Let's get to our feature for today, The Liberator. Welcome, everyone, to the finale of Bomber Month 2021. We're going to go round out our return to the bombers with a look at the Consolidated B-24 Liberator, another one of the World War II-era heavy bombers that, you know, I don't really think gets as much coverage as some of the other bombers we've already discussed here on the show. So let's do that. Let's see what we can find out about this thing. And now, as usual, I'm not the expert on the subject aircraft. Fortunately for us, we were able to find someone that is amongst a bunch of other aircraft of the era, and that's Mr. Jim Harley. Jim, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been a couple months, I think, since we last spoke on uh, coordinating for the episode and getting everything recorded. So I'm so grateful you're willing to come down here and sit with us and uh, chat about your experience in Liberator. And we'll get through all the stats, I guess, that you have and uh, hopefully get some comparisons to some of the other aircraft you've flown. Absolutely. I've been fortunate enough to get time in most of the bombers, except the B-29. B-24 was probably the most flying I've done in, in a bomber. So that's whatever, great. whatever you need to know. You've got more hours in it than I do. So uh, you're definitely the right man to talk about it. So again, obviously our focus today is the Liberator, but like we always like to do, let's learn a little bit more about who we're talking with. We'll start with your background and how you came to be involved in Warbirds. Sure. I grew up in an aviation family. Both my grandfathers were involved in flying. My one grandfather more than the other, but he had two airplanes. So I grew up flying with him. My dad's involved in aviation. He had a commercial license and we flew RC models. I mean, since I was a little kid, it's just been part of my life. Books, movies, everything. I just immersed myself in aviation. When I got out of college, I finished my pilot's license and was flying spam cans. Just Cessnas, just renting Cessnas. So when Collings came along in uh, late 2002, I jumped at the chance. I had flown a B-25. I bought a ride in a B-25 and got right seat time. I bought a ride in a Mustang. And to be honest, that was probably the epitome of where I thought I'd end up. I got the time I wanted in the airplanes that I love. So and I actually bought a ride in a B-17 and got stick time in it, aluminum overcast back in 98. Collings came along in 2002 and 
hired me, that was it. That was the dream shot. That was my end to the community. Cause it's really hard to break into the Warburg community unless you have a lot of money. Which yeah. I don't. <laughs> yeah. So, we're definitely uh, learning a lot about how much it takes dollars wise to uh, own and operate a B24. Any Warbird, frankly, doesn't even matter anything. what, but yeah. Yeah. So as far as experience with the Warbirds and all the different types and specifically the B24, what's your uh, hours quantity and how much time do you have behind the stick or wheel? I started flying co-pilot right away in 2003 and ended up getting type rated in 2009. I was flying a B-17 more than the B-24. That's why it took so long. I see. By the time I got typed in the B-24, I probably had three, 400 hours in it. By the time I got typed and when I retired, I had amassed almost 1,300 hours in it. I haven't added my logbook up. I didn't do my last year logbook, but it's probably close to 1,400. Okay. Not just the B24, kind of like I mentioned, and you've discussed. So you had B17 time and B25 time, P51 time. Anything else we missed? A little bit of Sky Raider time, T33. I flew the ME262 a little bit. Yeah, everything they had that was available, I pretty much got the seat and <laughs> made sure I got some time in it. It was available. Yeah, it was that's a hell great. of an opportunity. So. Yeah, absolutely. I say I'm trying. I would love to say I'm actively trying, but I have yet to actually ride in a Warbird. But that being said, at least for me and probably a few other people out there, it is one of those dream bucket list types of items that you want to go fly in one of these things. And so eventually, someday, I will carve out some time to make that happen. But fortunately, we have people like you that get to have done it or get to do it on a regular basis and, and are smart on the aircraft itself. So that's fantastic. And again, we appreciate you coming on the show to talk about this. You mentioned the Collins Foundation. Can you tell me about that organization and anything else you want to bring up about working in Warbirds? Was that more of a full-time job or what kind of relationship did you have with them? Collins started in 1989. The restoration of the B-24, they had the B-17, but it was mostly an airshow airplane. Right. And they also had the B-25, and they were doing airshows with it. When it got to B-24, Bob Collins decided to start the Wings of Freedom Tour. The initial intention was to tour between 1989 and 1995, which was the 50th anniversary of World War II. Around late 1995, they started giving rides, and they realized that it could sustain itself through the funding of the rides and it wasn't coming out of Bob's pocket to fund these things that go around the country. Yeah. And that's where it all snowballed. It became a, a ride operation. That's what paid for all the gas and the oil and the insurance. And it was self-sustaining. Which is great. It affords everybody the opportunity, kind of like we've discussed, to experience that beyond just seeing it in an air show. You get to feel it, touch it, and so much more. So that is really great. And we've had a bunch of different organizations or representatives from other organizations come on the show and discuss kind of some of those different aspects of the Warbird community that we don't really get to see, you know, running an operation in that way, but is in a lot of ways necessary because otherwise it is a very expensive way. You know, to... we, the spiel was we did 110 cities in 38 states in 11 months, and wow. it was seven days a week. Every three days we were in a new town, thousands of people, hundreds of veterans. It's just an incredible legacy. In my opinion, it is a necessary one. But that being said, we're here to talk about the Liberator. So let's jump into it. Now for our listeners, if you're listening to the show on release day, December 24th, 2021, then you missed its first flight by about 82 years and five days, give or take, which was December 29th, 1939. That being said, Jim, let's get started by discussing where the initial requirement for the Liberator came from back in 1938. So about a year, year and a half prior to that. And that also kind of coincides with the sort of de facto competition that it's had with the B-17 ever since. So long way to get to what's the requirement process that triggered the B-24's creation? The B-17 came along in 1935, and it was our only four-engine heavy bomber. It was 30s technology. Big wing, kind of slow, small bomb load, tail dragger, definitely the period airplane. And Reuben Fleet, who was the CEO or owner of Consolidated Aircraft, took it upon himself and David Davis to build a new modern bomber, which culminated in the B-24. If you look at the fleet Consolidated Aircraft, they were mostly flying boats. We joke that the Consolidated Coronado was a flying boat that looks a lot like the B-24. It looks like they just cut the hull off, put a landing gear in it, and <laughs> a bomb bag. Call it call good. It, yep. Call it good. It snowballed from there, and it went straight into service. It was a pretty amazing design for its time, just to go from production design right into combat. When we talk about initial requirements, what 
are the initial requirements that the, in this case, probably the U.S. Army Air Forces had for whatever this thing was that was going to come out? They wanted an airplane to compete with the B-17 as far as payload. B-24 carries double the payload, theoretically. Okay. The, the speed, theoretically, it was faster and theoretically could go higher. To be honest, it fell short of a lot of those okay. claims, but it was still a superior airplane as far as systems and modernization with the nose wheel and the wing design was far advanced as B-17. It was the modern airplane until the B-29 came along. Boeing just blew it out of the water with the B-29. So yeah, made the B-24 immediately obsolete. As technology advances and needs and necessity kind of take hold, you definitely find ways to advance. And, and that seems to be the case with this and many, many things along throughout history. So, well, very good. And uh, I think when it was being developed, it was Project A, I think that was the uh, initiator, if you will, for this process and the B-24. And you kind of alluded to the B-29 coming up and then potentially maybe even the B-36, which we're trying to find somebody that is knowledgeable, smart, and and has, you know, some interesting ideas and stories on what the B-36 was. So hopefully down the road, we'll be able to get that for maybe a future bomber month. But in terms of the mission that the B-24 was expected to perform, obviously it's a bomber, so it's going to drop ordnance on whatever the target set is. But is that what it actually did in the war or was it beyond just striking targets? That was its primary design mission. It was a high altitude bomber. It had defensive positions, just like the B-17, had a nose turret, hail turret, the waist guns, the ball turret, top turret. It ended up being a maritime patrol bomber as well in RAF service and our service. So it was actually a multi-mission airplane, but its primary role in in the majority of them ended up seeing service as high-altitude bombers. All right. Makes sense based on what it was asked to go do. About how far could it go. You talked about a very advanced wing, and I'm assuming there's some efficiencies with that wing that weren't available to the B-17, like you mentioned, but how far was it capable of going? Well, like any airplane, it depends on winds and the day. With the Tokyo tanks installed, the B-24 that I flew was in the RAF. It was KH-191, and it served out of Libya. And the logbooks indicated some of the missions were as long as 18 hours. Oh my goodness. From everything that I've read, and talk to veterans, the average mission over Europe from England to Berlin and back was around 11 hours average. Okay. So it varied, but yeah, 18 hours is a long time to be in the P-24. Yeah, definitely. So. Speaking with Larry Kelly, uh, he flies the B-25 Panchito. He talked about the temperature control, if you will, inside the aircraft. And I'll say it better lack of temperature control in the aircraft. And that seems like it's a theme throughout all these aircraft. And you see it in movies, they got the nice jackets and fuzzy hats and everything else to keep themselves warm. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. What's the experience like as a crew member in the aircraft while you're flying around? We know we joke the B-24 has its own weather system. (laughs) (laughs) It's cold. It's drafty. There's a lot of holes in the airframe. Allow cold air, hot air. On tour, I had it up to 13,000 feet once, and it was miserable. It was just freezing cold. But the difference in the B-25, the B-25 didn't have the rheostats for the heated flying suits. And every crew station in the B-24, they call them griddle suits because sometimes they short it out. But they're wire mesh suits that they could turn the heat up and down in their suits. And they had the big B-3 jackets, and frostbite was rampant in the 8th Air Force and the 15th because of the altitudes they were at. So you see a lot of guys with scarring around their eyes and... That was a big problem. Yeah, it's cold. The B-24 that you flew, did they have all of the openings for the waist guns and everything closed off? No. The waist guns, they have a hinged window that folds up inside the fuselage. 9% of the time we had those open. Is that just for the experience more than comfort, probably? Yeah, for sure. Because it's drafty. (laughs) Yeah, I can imagine. And it's a lot of drag, too. So with those windows shut, It is a drag on it, but you know what we were doing? We didn't care. It was more about the experience. We wanted people to see the windows open and the guns flexing around. You can move the guns. Okay. So let's jump into the variants then, because that talks then to the multitude, first off, uh, different variants that are listed. And you're not going to see, I think as we've kind of gone through the different variants of other warbirds, you're not going to see major differences on every single leap between, but let's talk through you know, a good chunk of the variants that are out there. And in terms of overall production, from my notes, 
There are over 18,000, I believe, that were produced in all of the different variant types. Those are both US versions and British versions. I believe there were some Canadian versions as well out there. And we'll talk through some other uh, potential proliferation as we get a little bit further here. But let's start out with the baseline B24, if there even is such a thing, the B24A. And then we started with nine of those produced. And then there was a British equivalent called the LB30 Bravo. And there were 20 of those produced. From the way I understand it, and Jim, you can fill me in with any additional information there, but similar to the Lend-Lease programs for other countries that we use, we basically were trying to provide a bomber to the Brits at the outset of the war. So they had something to defend themselves with. Is that kind of right? Yeah, that's correct. That sums it up. The LB-30, it didn't have the turbo. And some of the earlier variants that were sent to Britain, actually ones that we had in service, didn't have the turbo supercharger installed off the exhaust. They're all supercharged, but to the accessory case of the engine, but the turbos came a little bit later. Okay. And then just for setting the scene, this is a four engine bomber, just like the B-17. Bigger. How do you compare the size of the aircraft, the B-24 versus the B-17? They're pretty comparable. You know, the wing on the B-24 is 10 foot longer. Okay. The length's about the same, give or take. The B-24 was designed around the Bombay. What they wanted to do was double the size of the Bombay. So they made it a shoulder wing, put the wing on top. It was just their version of an advanced bomber that was better in their minds than the B-17. Okay. So from that initial B-24A slash LB-30 Bravo configuration, then it jumps into the Liberator B Mark II or just the straight LB-30. And there are 165 of those produced. And that was the first combat ready one. And it had self-sealing fuel tanks. What version did you fly? The J. The J. Okay. So we have six versions to go before we get to the J. But I'm not going to spoil anything along the way. You'd already covered the supercharger, turbocharger coming a little bit later. What about the crew complement? So let's talk about the crew complement. How many people were involved in operating the aircraft for the combat missions? There were 10 guys on the average crew. Summit 15th Air Force groups used 11. So it varied. Towards the end of the war, they actually eliminated a waste gunner. So it varied between 9 and 11. 9-11. All right. So we're talking a two-pilot kind of operation. Is that true? It is. It's very much a two-pilot. It's got a pilot and a required co-pilot. A lot of stuff from the pilot seat you can't reach over to the co-pilot side to get to. Okay. You also had a flight engineer on board who served as the top turret gunner. And he was your third set of eyes. And we operated the same. Very good. So they're, they're a necessary part of the crew. Sure. Let's talk about the bombardier. So where were they located? And... What were they using to employ their weapons? The Bombardier was up in the nose, both the D model and the J model and the H, which were the three primary combat versions that we used. There was a nose turret gunner up front, the Navigator, and the Bombardier. And the Bombardier used a Norton bomb site, just like all our bombers, the classified pickle in the barrel bomb site. They were all up front. Okay. So that's the Bombardier, the pilot, the co pilot, the engineer. And then that's four. Uh, as far as the rest, were the rest of the crew complement all related to defense of the aircraft itself? We had a radio operator who sat behind the pilot and co-pilot in some versions. Some they sat above the wing. There was a little station above the wing in some versions that they sat above. He had two ace gunners, a tail gunner, a ball turret gunner, and then the flight engineer, top turret gunner. So that was the average crew complement. Okay. You talked about the Bombay. I know on... Some of the bombers that we've covered in the past, the access to aft of the Bombay is easier than in others or not possible at all. What's that experience like to try to go from one end of the aircraft to the next, the other, I should say? If I remember right, it's nine inches wide, that catwalk. And it's actually the keel of the airplane. It's an integral part of the airframe. So it's pretty stout. You don't want to step on the Bombays. The doors, they're on rollers and they have little Bakelite hinging mechanisms that run up and down the side of the fuselage. And they're actually designed to break away. If a bomb lets go in flight, they're meant to break the doors away so you don't have something catastrophic happen. So you don't want to step on these. There's rope lines going between each vertical upright of the uh, bomb racks. And you just hang on to that, and make your way to the back or front, whichever way you're going. And it's not uncomfortable. I mean, unless it's a bumpy day, it is a bit colder in there because you don't have the bulkheads blocking wind, but because of air leaks into the Bombay doors. But, you know, a lot of the veterans I talked to, they didn't traverse the airplane unless they absolutely had to. So 
it wasn't something they did all the time. And they had that big bulky flight gear on and nine inches wide. Not so uh, much. Doesn't make it easy. Yeah. No, not so much. Let's talk about the, you know, aft of the Bombay. So you had the two waist gunners, the ball turret gunner, if one was installed, and then you had the tail gunner for the ball turret that was not originally on the aircraft. Is that accurate? That's correct. Depending on the version, the uh, 24D, there were almost 2,700 of those. The first it shows here, 287 off the line, had a remotely operated and periscopically sighted Bendix belly turret. So I'm assuming that's one that is just some guy at a control station operating it, not having to climb into that ball turret. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's accurate. They laid on the floor basically and operated the gun. Okay. Uh, and it was a visually a sighted gun. So they had to lay to actually physically move the gun. And so it wasn't a remote turret. Okay. Yeah, but they laid there and had a little window they looked through. All right. According to this, it said it proved unsatisfactorily. So then yeah. they shoved that same ball turret that you see in like the Memphis Bell and that poor little guy, because clearly it's not a sizable ball. I had to climb in there and hang out in that ball turret while they're in the target area. So that seems crazy to me. The retractable Sperry ball turret. Yeah, same ball turret that's on a B-17, but because the B-24 is a nose wheel airplane and it sits so low to the ground, it would row over rotate or, you know, you flare too much, it's going to scrape that off. So they made it retractable. To be honest, it's actually a pretty comfortable spot. Is it? Uh, I'm six foot and I fit fine. It's probably the safest place in the airplane statistically. Uh, <laughs> believe it or not only because you can shoot back or is that some it's other armored ah. you know <laughs> none of us have flown combat in so we really can't say but i've never heard a b-24 ball turret gun really complain about it, other than the noise and the 250s right by your ears i mean that, yeah that is a favorite response from the ball turret gun <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure osha is glad they didn't exist at that point because they'd have so many claims against hearing loss and safety. The whole war. And so <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Well, that was the 24D and then it would jumped into the 24E. And what's unique about the 24E in your mind? In the Pacific, a combat crew decided to take a clapped out B-24 airframe that had seen its service, take the tail turret off and put it in the nose. It was a field modification. And when Consolidated got wind of this, they actually implemented that in the production line. So, you know, it was a big change to put the nose turret up there. They took off the glass nose with the little pea shooter 50 in the front or 30, I think they had in the front. Yeah. Yeah, they put the nose turret on it. You know, some systems changed, but not much. There wasn't a whole lot changed throughout the production run except the nose turret. So that was a big deal. And the turbos, that was a big deal. Yeah. Service ceiling for the aircraft, what was it supposed to do? And what did it normally do? <laughs> Yeah, it's when you don't believe book numbers all the time. Sure. I think it was supposed to get up to 35,000 feet. Most of the crews I talked to said 28 was about tops. B-17 guys love B-24s flying with them in combat because they flew low. They called them their escort. <laughs> <laughs> they were easier to get to because the 17s could go so much higher. As the war progressed, the missions got lower. Yeah. So it was all relative. They didn't really go up that high. And it struggles. It really struggles. It's not something I'd want to do on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, that's fair. Especially when you're going into combat and people are trying to shoot at you. It does say in the notes that I've got here that the time to climb to, I think it was 20,000 feet was 25 minutes. So you kind of have to be a long way away from where you're trying to get to. You know, I know out of England, not, probably not so much Italy because they had a long way to go to get over the mountains and up into Austria, but out of England, they would circle above the base and just start their climb and forming up as they took off. I mean, they just go right into a climb. And by the time they got to the coast, they were on their way up. So yeah. it was the 25 minute window. It's about accurate. Yeah. So Consolidated was the original designer and creator of the aircraft. Who else produced these things? Because we've had other aircraft that uh, were produced by multiple companies. Anybody else that produced these? Henry Ford took on the B-24 project and I think they built six or 7,000 of them uh, at the Ford plant in Willow Run. Funny story about Ford, when he designed the plant, the plant started in one county and ended in another county to avoid taxes. So that's kind of a... Wow. That's a <laughs> yeah, he made sure it made a turn coming out. Ford also made kits. I guess there's no other better word for it. They sent them to North American. And okay. North American would assemble them. So it was basically consolidated Ford and North American that were responsible for the airplane. Oh, fascinating. All right. For those kits, do you have any knowledge about what they kind of showed up to the assembly facility as? 
wings, fuselages, and tail. And they had GFI, government furnished equipment, or GFEs, I guess they call them. Government furnished equipment would be the guns and some of the accessories for combat. So, All right. Very good. We talked about the four engines, horsepower production on each of those. And then you talked about the turbo supercharger information, I guess. What does that look like for thrust production? The 1830 put out 1,200 horsepower. The same as the B-17, actually. You know, you had Pratt and Whitney and he had Wright. The Wright's a dirty engine. Ask anybody. They leak more oil than they burn. The 1830's a uh, much better engine. Depending on how it's run, you can't abuse them, but it's a really solid engine. With the turbo system installed, it'll make 1,200 horsepower all the way up to altitude. And uh, once you get above 10,000 feet, you need turbo. Just won't do it. Yeah, it just won't do it. All right. So for those bad boys on this airplane, we talked about the physical size. What is the weight of a empty aircraft? Uh, about 36,000 pounds, I think, is the empty weight. We were flying around between 40 and 45,000, depending on the fuel. We didn't have all the fuel tanks installed. Okay. When it was restored, most of them were taken out. So we had one tank per engine, and we held about 1,600 gallons of gas. We topped it off. But we never really topped it off. I only flew it around, I think, at the most, eight or 900 gallons of gas. Okay. So it wasn't too obnoxiously heavy. Yeah, it's starting to get up there. And so then that's the fuel capacity. I've got here normal capacity, 2,344 US gallons. If you add the additional long range tanks in the bomb bay, which I'm assuming the bomb bay is big enough that obviously it's got to get there and drop some bombs. So they're going to have part of it taken up by fuel bladders. The other part of it, bombs, reduces the bomb carrying capacity, but that's 3,600 gallons. What was the bomb capacity for this? Theoretically, 8,000 pounds. Okay. I know the book says higher. I've never seen any indication anywhere where they carried more than 8,000 pounds. They could have. Okay. It was a weight issue, weight and fuel and range. And so they had to vary it. There's a load stick next to the pilot seat. And it's kind of neat because it was still installed in the airplane when we restored it. They put it back in there. And you could sit there in a little whiz wheel and figure out your bomb load for target and range and all that stuff. But yeah, I'd say around 8,000 pounds was probably a good load. All right. Perfect. Speed. What was it supposed to do? What did it normally do? And then what do you guys do with it while you're flying around with it? Down low, like I said, we didn't usually go over 1,500 to 2,000 feet, you know, even between cities or doing rides, just burnt gas going up. You didn't really need to do that because your efficiency goes up. Once you get up in the thinner air, I'm sure it would do more, but we ran 30, 20, 30 inches of manifold pressure and 2,000 RPM, which is the book combat power setting. We didn't baby it that way. Okay. Basically, it needs it to fly. Uh, <laughs> so, you, know, you just set it where the book says and it does fine. You know, down low, we were getting about 180 miles an hour out of it. Up high, you could probably bump that up probably maybe 220, 230 once you get up the altitude. So you get up in the thinner air, it'll probably do a little bit better. So, okay. You know, even up around 13,000 feet, we didn't get more than 180 out of it. So I never took it up higher than that. All right. You talked about the more advanced wing. What made it more advanced, I guess, than what the B-17 had on it? Uh, the Davis wing, they called it a high aspect ratio wing, which okay. meant it was longer and narrower, which theoretically is re- less drag. The B-17 has a really wide cord. It's more of a Piper Cub airfoil versus the B-24, which is more of a laminar flow, which, you know, there's center of pressure differences and everything that you could, that they knew at the time to put into a low drag wing. Unfortunately, the downside of that, they sacrifice stability and low speed handling characteristics with the airplane. It's hard to describe. We can get into the flying characteristics of the airplane because that's where the wing really comes into play. Yeah. I can dive into that. Yeah, sure. Let's do it. That's on the list of questions as we normally ask. So we talked about how high, how fast, how slow. So I see a stall speed about 95 miles an hour. Is that about right? What the book says. Yeah. <laughs> when it quits flying, it quits flying. So you sure. keep about 10 to 20 miles an hour over that. And obviously, majority of the time, you're not hanging around that speed until you're ready to touch down. So what's your normal post-flight landing speed, do you think? There's no published VMC for the airplane. They didn't explore that range. So we use 140 to 150 as a baseline in the pattern. All right. But once you turn base to final, you're starting to slow down to 130 over the fence between, uh, well, 120 was the happy speed. Okay. Over the fence. And once you get it on the ground, once you touch down, you keep the nose wheel flying. And you use aerodynamic braking to slow the airplane down. Okay. The brakes are terrible. Use as many tools in the toolbox as you can before you start applying the brakes. So aerodynamic braking was key to getting it slowed down. Yeah. But it's funny. Once you touch down, it actually felt like, and it 
kind of accelerated once you get the wing, get the angle of attack down a little bit. It was a lot to get used to initially, but once you get that, you just pull back on the yoke and get the wing, the nose lay off. All right. Let's do just a point of comparison from landing the B-24 to landing B-17 or the B-25. What's the differences that you'd feel between and was it a hard transition to go from one to the next or could you make that comparison? Yeah, I'll start with the uh, comparison between the 17 and 24. The 17, it has a beautiful wing. It's almost like flying an airline. It's very stable. It's a great IFR platform. Crosswinds are a little tricky because it has a huge rudder or a fin, vertical fin, and it's like a boat sail, but the rudder is very small. Using differential power and ailerons, and again, tools in the toolbox when you're flying an airplane, the power to keep it straight. That's the only vice to the B-17 that I really found. But other than that, it's a cream puff to land. It's just honest. It's hard to find any vices with it. B-24, it's stable once you get to know it. But the elevator is really sensitive in pitch. You fly it with the trim. Once you learn to fly the airplane with the trim, it's like butter. There's a good learning curve in that. You know, we joke if somebody walked across the flight deck, you roll a dime across the flight deck, you have to retrain the airplane. So it's uh, <laughs> it's really dynamically unstable, I guess you call it. You know, the nose wheel obviously made things a lot easier. Directional control is a lot easier in the B-24. The twin rudders are very powerful. Once you close the throttles and touch down, you know, it's all rudder and, and brakes. You transition to the brakes. So from that point of view, it's a lot easier than the B-17. The B-25, it's like a twin-engine Mustang. It's just easy to fly. It is a pilot's airplane. I rave about the B-25. I love that airplane. Not so much as a heavy bomber. It was a medium bomber, but North American didn't design a bad airplane. <laughs> Fair assessment. <laughs> you know, they just didn't. They got it right. And that airplane, it's a hot rod. You know, VMC is published. It's 145 miles an hour. You lose an engine below 145, you just close the throttles and land, unless you have altitude. But on takeoff, if you lose an engine below 145, you just close them off and straight ahead. Yeah, That's its only real vice. But other than that, it's a rock-solid IFR platform. It, it goes where you put it. It's just a great airplane. I think most people would want what you just said in an airplane. I want to control it and I want it to do it at you know, what I'm telling it to go do. So that that's a good way to be. In terms of like the flight control system, is it a standard rods, cables, all that kind of stuff? What do they have in the B-24 for the flight controls? Yeah, it's the same basic setup as the B-17. It's all cables. There's no hydraulic assist or hydraulic boost. It's all cables. There's backup cables on both sides of the airplane in case one got shot out. The landing gear, the brakes are all hydraulic and the bomb bay doors. So there really wasn't too much as far as hydraulics go in the airplane. You don't have to worry about anything getting shot out. You can still fly the airplane and manage it back to base. Nice. In terms of the feel of the controls while you were flying, not necessarily in the landing regime, but in regular cruise flight or any other phases of flight, light, heavy, pain in the butt, what would you say? There are a few analogies I'll make reference to during this. One of my co-pilots who initially got in the airplane summed it up. He said, this thing flies like a bathtub half full of water. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, that's probably the best assessment I've ever heard about a B-24. It doesn't do straight. Okay. You're on the controls all the time. Like I said, it's really pitch sensitive. So if somebody walks in the cabin, you know, you can feel it. It's rudder heavy. There's a lot of adverse yaw. When you roll in ailerons, the nose goes the other way. Mm -hmm. So you lead everything with the rudder in turns and just keep it coordinated. You're using a lot of rudder. The rudder and the elevator are really light. The rudder pedal's massive, and you've got a lot of leverage on them. If you keep the seat close to the panel, you've got a lot of leverage on them, and they're really light. So it really is just pressures. The ailerons, moderately heavy. I would say just maneuvering around, you're probably putting in 15 to 20 pounds of pressure on the yoke, you know, mm -hmm. maneuvering the ailerons around. Once you get used to it, it's not hard to manage. And like I said, you're using the trim a lot, the elevator trim. The Davis wing was critical at angle of attack. So we call it flying on the step. And what you do, you climb about 100 feet over the altitude you want to level off at, and you push the nose over. The airplane actually flies at a nose-down angle, and that's where it makes its best speed and performance. If you start pulling back on the yoke, it doesn't climb, it just wallows. And you can watch the airspeed indicator unwind. You can see it go from 180 to 150 with a new guy. <laughs> so wow. it's just, just a little bit of back pressure on the yoke, and you can watch the airspeed. 
just go away. Just go away. Wow. It's the most unique airplane I've ever flown. I've never flown an airplane that flies like this. Man, very interesting. Is there anything that you've come across and, you know, speaking of analogies or those types of things that you'd be able to attribute this to? Because I imagine that a lot of the way that the airplane flies while you're giving people rides or something like that is different than probably what it flew like in combat when it's got a full bomb load, a full fuel load and everything else. And it's a lot heavier. Is there anything that you could maybe attribute it to when it comes to a really, you know, full combat load? If that makes sense. Yeah. If you've ever lost power steering on your car. Okay. That's probably the best way to describe it. Yeah. It feels about the same. Okay. The way that he described with like a half full bathtub, you know, you put a control input in and then it's like a a little bit of a delay for the airplane to actually move. Is that kind of accurate? Yeah. You you know, you roll it in and you wait and you know, you're pushing on the rudder. So you're starting to yaw and and then the ailerons catch up and it stays coordinated. You can watch the ball stay right in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. You anticipate turns, everything you anticipate. So you learn a good 10, 15 second delay and everything. So yeah, no, that's good. If I remember correctly for landing in a B-17 or any of the tail dragging types of aircraft, it required potentially a spotter above the ground. Did you guys ever use a spotter or anything to determine how high above the ground you might need to be? I'll say this, the B-17 is a lot easier to see out of. Okay. The 24, no, nah, I mean, it's all visual. and the, You can see enough to land the airplane. The only time we used a uh, spotter was taxiing because you can't see the wingtips from the uh, cockpit. Oh, okay. So there's a hatch right behind the pill pilot that drops down, and there's actually a step there that the engineer can step up on and hang outside the airplane to, uh, to make sure we're not going to hit any trees or obstacles. or. So we rely on him heavily on tight ramps and maneuvering around the airport. Congested areas and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, as we've talked through all the different airplanes, we talk about the communication system within the airplane, because obviously it's a very big airplane. You can't see each other. So what did they, and what do you guys use to communicate while you're flying around? During the war, each crew uh, station had a comm box. So they were all interconnected with the inner phones and they had throat mics. They could talk to each other. For what we were doing, the pilot, co-pilot and the flight engineer were the only ones set up to talk. Passengers couldn't get on headset. The uh, flight engineer had a microphone connection in the nose up on the flight deck and then back in the tail. And they were all on extension. So he could get anywhere in the airplane and stay on headset. Perfect. Let's jump into the armament. And I think everybody can probably appreciate the standard stuff. We've already covered the crew complement and what was there, but as time went by, we added waste guns and we'd change ball turrets and we talked about the nose gun. But generally speaking, what was the armament that was on the B-24 throughout the war? They used 50 caliber Brownings. That was a standard gun. Uh, I think early on they might have a 30 in the nose, but they were all upgraded to the 50. So you had two in the uh, nose turret. You had two in the top turret. You had two in the waist, two in the ball turret, and two in the tail turret. They called them cones of fire. And when they got into a box formation, the theory was that all the airplanes are protected by all the guns through these cones of fire. So they were spitting lead everywhere. Of course, fighters still got through and there's nothing you could do about flak, but they had great defensive. Even if the gunner couldn't shoot, they're still putting lead out there and it was a deterrent to the uh, enemy fighters. Absolutely. We've, I think, primarily stayed in the realm of the U.S. Army Air Forces. Did the British versions differ that much when it came to any of the equipment on it, any of the armament or any of that kind of stuff? Our B-24 came off the consolidated line in August of 1944. It went straight to the RAF and the only thing they changed was the paint job. So (laughs) that was the extent of the Lend-Lease program. As far as I know, they used them as maritime patrol bombers mostly. Okay. Uh, They had the Lancaster and the Lincoln and those aircraft for uh, their bombing missions. So night yeah. bombing and, and everything else like that. Right. They didn't do a whole lot of daytime stuff. Okay. The Navy, the United States Navy also took some of these aircraft and converted them into what I have here are uh, like photo recon versions of the aircraft, even some transport versions. You talked about the twin rudder on the typical B-24, but they actually made some modifications to the rudder, the empennage. Can you talk about any of those modifications? Yeah, that was the PB4Y. They extended the nose, I think, six feet. 
six or seven feet, if I remember right. And then they put the big vertical stab on it, and that was for directional control. They used them for uh, reconnaissance and maritime patrol. That was their primary mission. So, okay, um, you don't hear too much about the Navy using them, but they did. They used them pretty extensively. Yeah, I was surprised to find I didn't realize they were going to get involved. I guess in in heavy bomber or heavy reconnaissance. Maybe I don't know what the right way to put. They that had B seventeens but... too. Yeah, yeah, mother of necessity, I guess. What about bombs? So let's talk about the bombs that it carried. Any things special about these? Just standard dumb bombs or different sizes? Yeah, you know, the Pacific and the European theaters differed a lot. I mean, they used uh, stick bombs. They used 250-pounders, 500-pounders, 1,000-pounders. I'm pretty sure they got up into the 2,000-pounders. Uh, of course, that would reduce your load, you know, sure. the number of bombs you could carry. But yeah, they used whatever we had. And they were all dumb bombs. You know, they relied on the Norden bomb site to get into the target. In the Pacific, their missions were a lot lower. They actually eliminated the ball turrets in a lot of those because it was just a weight consideration and they could, you know, add to the load. And, you know, they were down under 5,000 feet most of the time. So the ball turret was ineffective. Yeah. That thing carried everything. Whatever we had, they would drop. Throw it on there and go. Yeah. In terms of efficiency, obviously the higher you get in theory, they are thinner and you get a lot more range and and everything else associated with it. Comparing the B-17 and the B-24, I'll take the B-25 out because that's a a smaller aircraft, but comparing those two heavy bombers, which one was more efficient in your mind? The joke was, if you want to get more bombs to a target faster, you take a B-24. If you want to get home, you take a B-17. <laughs> so wow. uh, I think the B-24 had the advantage as far as speed and efficiency. B-17 was a slower airframe. It just it had a thick wing. It wasn't as aerodynamic. Prettier in some people's minds. but sure. uh, It looks more aerodynamic. From the pictures I've seen everything, it looks a lot more aerodynamic. But maybe it's the you know, horsepower rating, the thickness of the wing and so on and so forth. And it didn't match up, but obviously it's an earlier design and consolidated. I think if it had bigger engines, it would have done a lot better, but you know, they use a tech that they had at the time and they, they tried Allison's on a B-17 and it did perform better, but you know, the war effort dictated 1820s go to a B-17, 1830s go to a B-24 and Allison's go to P-38s and P-40s. And I don't know if it was a supply issue, but it just wasn't implemented into the production line, but they did try it. Yeah. You know, by that time, the B-17 was already obsolete. I mean, we get down to it, but... Time gets everybody, yeah. equipment and people. So we talked about the Navy having some. We talked about the British using theirs as maritime patrol. Any other countries that this was proliferated to? Well, Australia used them. They were basically part of the RAF, I guess. Royal yeah. Australian Air Force, probably under the same Commonwealth. But after the war, our B-24 witchcraft ended up with the Indian Air Force, and the Indians used them extensively after the war. They used them up into the 60s, believe it or not. Oh, wow. All the uh, B-24s that the British abandoned as part of the Lend-Lease program, they went through and refurbished the best of the airframes. I think they had 35 of them that they ended up getting going, and they used them up into the 60s. And I would say 90% of the B-24s that survive today are from the Indian Air Force. We scrapped them all. Were they maintained as bombers or were they transitioned to other missions? They were maritime patrol bombers and yeah, they ready to go and the wow. guns and everything armored wow. up. So fascinating. I heard rumor that maybe during the war, the Germans got a hold of some and repainted them in Luftwaffe colors and paint schemes, but would try to infiltrate American or British bomb trains. Any truth to that? Do you hear anything that from your discussions? Yeah, that's absolutely true. JG4, JG5. I forget the JG number. Don't quote me on that. Yeah, they had P-38s. They had Mustangs. They had B-24s. They had B-17s. And the mistake they made is they put swastikas on them and painted them oddball colors so everybody knew they were coming when they saw them. But they would try to sneak into the formations and start shooting at bombers. They did the same thing with the fighters as well. But like I said, they painted them. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So you knew they were a captured airplane if you were keen on it. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's absolutely true. They did try it. Wow. That's amazing. There is obviously some uh, sneakiness that goes on in combat, but I guess they were trying to be honorable in some form or fashion by actually painting them their own colors. So good on them for being honorable, but it's bad for tactical application, I guess. So, Uh, well, getting back to the maritime patrol stuff, we did have a listener question and uh, it's from Michael Durkak. And he asks, why did they start to use liberators to protect Atlantic convoys and the fight with German U-boats? 
Well, we had a big problem with our shipping lanes being infiltrated by U-boats. They were sinking a lot of ships. So the U.S. employed, and the British too, actually, they employed B-24 as a maritime patrol bomber, and they would go out and escort the ships. And they had the range with the Tokyo tanks installed in the Bombay. They had a lot of loiter time, so they could follow these guys way out in the ocean. And they supplemented the blimps, believe it or not. They had blimps that they used to uh, do the same mission. But that was the primary role of the 24, was just the range and the capability of escorting these guys way out in the ocean. Sure. Michael had added in his question. I didn't uh, ask it initially, but he added, why did they start so late? And through my research, it looked like towards the latter half of World War II. So do you have any idea as to why that would have been when they started, Vice, right up front? I honestly don't. Other than maybe a supply issue, most of the bombers were pressed into service overseas sure. in training. And then I guess maybe as the U-boat problem ramped up, they might have implemented them. I'm just guessing at this point. That seems like it makes a lot of sense. What were they using in those missions as, in terms of uh, ordnance to attack the U-boats if they found them? Same as a combat in-theater airplane. They'd put 500-pounders on them or you know, whatever ordnance they could put in it. So. Would they use depth charges? Did you hear about that at all? I have not, but that's a distinct possibility. It's one place I haven't really researched, so I'll be honest. No, that's fair. <laughs> Other ordnance that the uh, B-24 carry, we talked about bombs. We had talked about the self-defense guns and that kind of thing. Did they ever turn it into like an attack version like the B-25 at all? No. <laughs> that's, that's, a small, that's a small planes game. <laughs> this is too lumbering to even think about. That's fair. Mm. Now, during the Pulaski raids, they were down low and the gunners were shooting the waste gunners and they were shooting at ground targets. So that, but they were down low. Sure. Makes sense. You got a gun, you might as well, I guess, use it. So better to shoot at somebody else than them shoot at you, I guess. Rockets? Any rockets out there? I've never read an account of a B-24 using rockets, that or the B-17. They okay. did put external bomb racks on the B-17 at one point, but never any rockets. Okay. We cover proliferation and the Lend-Lease program. So now we move into, I think, one of the favorite segments here, and it's the strengths and weakness comparison. But as we like to do, we like to go favorite versus please fix this if you have a lot of money. So let's start with your favorite feature for the B-24. What's the favorite thing that you uh, look fondly upon? That's a really hard question. <laughs> you learn to love the airplane. It grows on you. And you have to approach it like that, especially when you first get in it, especially coming from a different airplane like the B-17. But once you figure it out, it flies beautifully. Once you learn its little vices of getting on the step or keeping the speed up on landing, it's just a beautiful flying airplane. It's hard to describe. You know, it's nice handling airplane once you figure it out. Is there any, I guess you can look at it from both directions, advantage or disadvantage to having flown a B-17 or another large type aircraft in that same vein before? Actually, just being here and being able to make that comparison uh, is pretty astounding. A lot of guys were one or the other. They were B-17 guys, B-24. I think one group in England that transitioned from the B-17 to the B-24, I don't know how prevalent that was throughout the theaters. Most of Italy was B-24s. I think they had two B-17 groups. They were dedicated to the 17, and England had more B-24s and B-17s, and they pretty much stuck with one or the other. Like I said, being a disadvantage as far as going from one to the other, it just gives you two different perspectives on what the war looked like from both sides of the bomber platforms. I'll ask the, the annoyances or things you wish you would fix, but do you have a sense of which bomber was more effective as a heavy bomber, the B-17 or the B-24? I think they both accomplished their missions equally. Okay. If a mission was called up in England or Italy or South Pacific, it was all hands on deck. I think... They both accomplished their missions as the platforms they were designed as equally. I think they both did their job admirably, and it comes down to a crew issue and what they preferred Yeah, and their loyalty. Sure. So then flip side of it, what do you want them to fix? What was the thing that you're like, this is really stupid. I wish they would have fixed this. Oh, where do I start? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep it short. The Achilles heel of the airplane is the prop cup. Amongst many Achilles heels, the biggest one was the prop governors. For the listeners, what is a prop governor? A uh, prop governor is a, basically, a, for lack of a better word, a pump that regulates the RPM of the engine through the propeller dome. All right. 
if you select 2000 RPM, it's an electrically controlled pump. Right in the middle of the console are four switches for each engine. There's a gang bar, or you can do them individually, and you adjust the RPMs with the prop governor. So once you get up in the cruise, you set the manifold pressure at 30 inches, and you bring the props down to 2000 RPM. And when you bump the switches down, these electrically controlled pumps bring the uh, RPM down to 2000 RPM. And the governor will maintain that no matter what you're doing for climbing, descending, they will always stay at 2000 RPM, theoretically. Where it comes into the Achilles heel part is they put the most fragile part, the governor, on top of the most vibration <laughs> prone bit of the airplane. And they bolted it right to the top of it. So they fail all the time. You know, the B-17 had cable governors. So they never fail. Being with the airplane almost 20 years, I think we changed one governor on the B-17. They just work. You know, the cables directly from the console right out to the governor. It moves it. You can actually watch it move on the top of the engine. Yeah. And uh, watch the RPM come down. The B-24, you just hit the switch and hoped. <laughs> 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 You know, okay, well, it doesn't work. You know, you gotta, you know, if it doesn't work and you're going up the cruise, you don't want to overspeed the engine because it's stuck at takeoff power. So you got to feather it and come back around and land, declare an emergency. That may have happened twice a year, but generally they failed in cruise because that's your longest duration configuration. And it's having to work the hardest to maintain it that entire time. Yeah. So if you got to push the props up for a go around and they don't work, you know, and once you get on the ground, you can change the governor pretty quick. That being said, they're unobtainium. You cannot find prop governors. We had about two dozen that we kept in constant overhaul. And we kept about three or four spares on the airplane because that's how frequently we were changing them. It's quite the part. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, it sounds like it. And we've talked to everybody that we've covered Warbirds with. And one of the questions is always the maintenance. How is something like this maintained? And obviously, as rare as a B-24 is, it's more rare than you know, P-51s and all that other stuff. So how is that supply chain, that logistics chain, if you will, to maintain and keep them going? Other than the prop governors, it's the same engine and prop that's on a DC-3, basically. Okay. So they're plentiful. They never had an engine issue. There's tons of engines, tons of spares. They're expensive. Sure. But they're out there. The cylinders, we always carried spares of everything we call consumables, which were cylinders, prop governors. Everything beyond that, uh, it's just chasing leaks on the engine, pushrod tubes. From that aspect, they're wonderfully designed. They're made to be maintained by 18-year-olds. If you go through the maintenance manuals for the airplane from the war, there's cartoons in them. Lester T. Boners in the front couple pages, and you don't do what Lester does. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. <laughs> so, you know, they're written for kids. Even the pilot's manual is written that way. The maintenance time, you know, we figured probably 10, 15 hours for every hour of flight, but that's a high number. Yeah. Uh, like I said, it was mostly chasing leaks in the engine yeah. and tightening up pushrod tubes. And just at rarely a, had any failures. At a ratio like that, what's kind of the guesstimated cost per flight hour? Realistically, probably in 2016 numbers, when I left, it was probably around, depending on fuel costs, probably between 3000 and 5000 an hour, realistically. Okay. You could probably factor in insurance. Insurance rates were going up at the time, so I didn't really ask about insurance rates. Just overall aircraft operation, it was probably between three and 5,000 an hour. Yeah. You know, each engine burns 50 gallons an hour of gas per hour, depending on the fuel costs. You know, we paid as high as $7 a gallon. <laughs> you know, wow. So that varied. We carried 20 gallons of oil per engine. I think it has a 40, 40 or 50 gallon reservoir. But you put any more in there, it just leaks it out. So yeah. we just maintained it at 20 gallons per engine. So, does it work on the philosophy that if it's not leaking oil, then it's out of oil? Any other round engine, I would agree with that 100%. Uh, mm -hmm. B24 didn't leak, it just did not leak. It burned oil, but it did not leak. If we rolled into a any California stop, they want you to have drip pans down. You know, you can put drip pans under the 17 and they'd look like a lake. <laughs> <laughs> you put them under the 24 and they're as dry as wow. when we got there. Wow. So, they're just a great engine. It's fragile, but it's a great engine. Yeah. You know, as we look at technology and advances, and we talked about the B-17 compared to the B-24, was in terms of technological leaps, was it a technological leap? Or would we consider, because the B-29 came later, would we consider that relative to the B-17, would we consider the B-29 the technological leap? 
aerodynamically, no, I would say that was probably the only technological leap. Just from a production standard, the philosophy was the same. They're built the same. The difference being the nose wheel. That was probably the biggest upgrade to our bomber fleet was the nose wheel. And that being said, that's when you're talking about vices, there's no nose wheel steering. And it's very, very hard. to ta- it's, Well, it's not hard to taxi once you learn it, but it's very hard to learn to taxi it. It's short coupled. There's no nose wheel steering. The hydraulic system pressurized to a thousand PSI. It's an open center system. So there's a thousand PSI running around the system all the time. And there's no deep booster on the brakes, which means that the B-17 has deep boosters. And when you push the brakes, fluid slowed down and it's regulated into the expander tubes, which push out the pucks mm-hmm. against those brake drums, which is what you hear squealing. Yeah. You think about the Memphis Bell, you hear the brake squealing. That's those pucks pushing out against the drums. B-24 does the same thing, but it's a hard application. It's not a soft application. You have to really learn to feather the brakes. What I always talk guys to do when they got in the airplane was put your big toe on the top of the brake, the ball of your big toe up there, and just push on them a little bit. You're not applying brake, and you're not slowing the airplane down. You're not running the brakes, but you have that charge in the system already going to the brakes. And then when you need it, you just lean into it. And that's feathering it, I call it. That's the whole secret to it. You get a lot of guys in there that stab them. Yeah. And we call it the elephant march when you guys got in the airplane. Yeah, you're bouncing around. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you know, it's like, yep. you need to point at him. You know, that's not me. <laughs> yeah. So well, it's like, you know, driving a car or anything like that. Obviously, we've got advanced braking systems on vehicles now, but, you know, you're just not sure how it's going to respond that first time you put your foot down and, yeah. you know, you put it down too hard and you're going to slam everybody forward. You're going to let go because you're terrified and everybody's slammed back Every, now. So you got it. And, you know, yeah. if you cock the nose wheel more than like, 30 or 40 degrees, you got to get the tow bar out and straighten the house. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to fix itself. Yeah. You can't yeah. undo that one once the genie's out. <laughs> Brake heat. I know on the B25s, that was, I think, a, a relatively big issue. Is that similar on the B24? Yeah. You know, my philosophy is don't use them unless you need them because they fade fast. Okay. Uh, the brake pucks are, they're a mix of asbestos and all kinds of weird chemicals and, if you overuse the brakes, they fade fast. Once they're gone, you're along for the ride. Theoretically, you can ground loop the airplane with the engines. You know, you can push up an outboard, and if you lose the brakes, you can stab one and get it turning, but you're not going to stop it. So, yeah. yeah, you just try not to use the brakes. Even taxiing, once you get up above, and I hate to say this, but once you get up around 15 knots on the ground, you can use the rudders. It's like wow. the B-25. Once you get a little speed on it, you don't need the brakes at all. So as wow. long as you have a nice clear, open run, you're good to go. That's impressive. Well, we're talking about scary stuff. So let's talk about your scary stuff. Do you have any big uh, scary stories or anything that was a little pucker factor, I guess, associated with what happened? You know, looking back, I lost one, two, three. I had three, no kidding, engine failures where I had to shut it down. Basically non-events. You know, generally we were in cruise. And if you punch one out in cruise, if you feather it, you can push the other two or three up, depending on what engine it was. If it was an outboard, you push the inboards up and vice versa. If you lose an inboard, you push the outboards up just to keep it going. It helps with keep directional control. Mm-hmm. Basically, a non-event unless it's really hot. Knock on wood, I never had happen. It was mostly cool days when I had a failure. You know, it flies fine on three engines. Uh, I never really had an issue with it on three. I've lost cylinders, uh, which is a non-event. Generally, you can keep it running. In the way we flew, we were close enough to the airport. You could declare and come in and land, and it's, again, a non-event. Lost a couple oil coolers, which the big concern there is fire. Yeah, You want to have your flight engineer looking at it while you're doing your job in case you have to pull a bottle or shut it down. Generally, if you lose an oil cooler and we're close enough to the airport, you don't have to shut it down because 20 gallons of oil goes a long way sometimes. Did the flight engineer have access to any of the controls at their own station or was it all just the one central control panel? Yeah, it was all pilot and co-pilot. The flight engineer did not have a station. He did not have a dedicated station. So okay. He could get to the controls between us. Okay. Uh, as far as scary moments, we took off out of Jackson Hole one time. The oil pressure on number one engine, which is the far left engine, started to waver. The chip light started flickering. Now, which is never a good sign. You know, when you get a chip like that, usually means the engine's failing. So we started going through the shutdown procedure. And I said, all right, my co-pilot, I said, all right, let's punch out one. Visually confirm you're hitting the big red switch that has the one on it. He hit one. 
<laughs> and it rained the previous night, so I should have prefaced this, but it had rained the previous night. Being an electric airplane is prone to moisture. When you hit the feather switch on one, I'm looking out the wing at one, waiting for it to shut down, you know, make sure it's working. Well, number three went in the feather. Wow. <laughs> and so the airplane started yawing real hard to the right, you know, because three was shut down. And I'm pushing on the left rudder thinking, what's going on here? And I look yeah. out at three and it's starting to shut down. So we popped the switch back out and three came back to life and we ended up landing with the engine running because we didn't want to exacerbate or you know, make a situation worse. So, you know yeah. what, if we toast an engine, we toast an engine, we're going to leave it wrong. Yeah. At least we so, saved the airplane. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So that was really, wasn't a scary moment. It was just, what's it doing now? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's it doing that? <laughs> it's never comfortable to be driving something and wondering, I wonder what it's going to do next. Yeah. Make yeah. it stop. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Please just let it do what I want it to do. Yeah. yeah. It was more weird than scary. Sure. I never really been scared in it. That's a good way to be. Well, let's jump into uh, celebrity. Kind of like I alluded to at the start, I know the B-24 existed. I've heard of it, and I know that it was in World War II and everything else like that, but it just doesn't have the, the oomph of a lore that the B-17 does. Are there any places that we can go watch a movie on this thing or read a book about it or anything that we might have known about it or something from someplace else in, in the public? Yeah, the Zamperini movie, Unbroken, is probably one of the few, if not the only B-24 movie that's really out there. Okay. You know, that's a good account of his life and times. I, it's not really too heavy on B-24 operations, but, you know, he was associated with it. Okay. And Stephen Ambrose wrote a book called The Wild Blue about George McGovern. It's funny, Stephen actually came out and flew our B-24 around the time that was published. But he sponsored the airplane. And in Collings, if you sponsor the airplane between cities, one of us will get out of the seat and let you fly the airplane a little bit, you know, just oh, to cool. get a feel for it. And, well, Steven got in the seat. He flew it for about a half hour. It was a long move. When we got on the ground, he goes, I got to go back and rewrite some of this book. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So that was kind of cool. That was, uh, he learned a lot in that little bit of time that he had in the airplane, but that's a really good read. Yeah. I also heard uh, maybe uh, The Mighty Eight by Roger Freeman. Is that a good one as well? The Mighty Eighth is probably the Bible for the Eighth Air Force. Roger Freeman grew up around the Eighth Air Force bases during the war. He's since passed away, unfortunately, but the book he wrote, he has the Mighty Eighth War Manual as well. You know, he went through all the combat reports and he interviewed a lot of guys. It's just a great read. It's hard to find these days. I don't even know if it's still published, but you can still find them on uh, eBay and Amazon. I always go to the Mighty Eighth as one of the best books regarding both B-17 and B-24 because it gives you sure. both. Yeah, that's great. That's a good comparison. Well, very good. All right. So now it is time for that famous segment that I just made up, but (laughs) not really because I've asked some other folks about it, about their experiences with other warbirds, but the which one is better segment. And so you've got experiences. We've talked about all three of the bombers in a question that you've flown. So which one is better? The 17, the 24, or the 25? You have to pick. You don't get a choice. That's, yeah, well, that's, a, that's a heck of a spot. <laughs> you know, I've got quite a bit of time in the 17 and 24. And I'll leave the B-25 out since it was a medium bomber and had a whole different mission profile. Sure. If I had to go into combat, and I hate... <laughs> this is not on record anywhere but now. No, no. Nobody's <laughs> listening to this at all. At all. No, no, no. Well, I mean, up to this point in all these years, I would take a B-24. Wow. I'm a B-17 guy at heart. Always have been. But if I had to go into combat, I would take a 24. What's the deciding characteristic that kind of puts you in that camp? When you fly both, when you fly a 17 a lot, and then you get in a B-24, you immediately recognize that it's more modern. It's a go-somewhere airplane. You know, you get a headwind, a B-17, you're, <laughs> you might as well be in a Cub. <laughs> B-24 just goes. It's hard to see out of. I mean, it's got so many vices. But... On the plus side, you know, once you learn to fly it, it handles well, it goes. We did a thing called bomber camp. Our customers would train as bombardiers, ball turret gunners. We put a live firing, blank firing 50 in the waist. We'd make concrete bombs, 500 pounders that were made from a 500 pounder mold. And that was probably the heaviest I've ever flown. You know, we put 10 of those things in there and you use up every bit of 5,000 feet getting off the ground, but it did it. You know, you climb up the altitude, you're heavy. I can't imagine flying a combat airplane because we had half the gas. Stockton, California in a hot day, we're 
barreling up the 4,000 feet or mission altitude. You know, you're trucking along and you drop all your bombs. The airplane doesn't budge. I mean, it just like nothing happened. You know, you dump all those things. I, I honestly don't know what a 500 pound concrete bomb weighs compared to an actual 500 pounder, but it's pretty heavy. Yeah. You know, the airplane doesn't budge. It's just rock solid. The 17, when you drop the bombs, it balloons. <laughs> yeah. Know, it's, it's just a different kind of flying. Would you guys do that with an autopilot engaged? Did it have an autopilot? I didn't ask that question earlier. Both airplanes, we made everything operational, but the autopilot and I think the uh, nose turret on the 24 were the only two things on either airplane that we didn't. But it did have an autopilot system on it. And all the veterans I've talked to, they said it didn't work too well. Hmm. It's just more of an assist yeah. more than anything. Stabilizer for formation flying. You know, it's just version one. Version one, yeah. When you get into the research and you realize, hey, they had autopilot and they had this and they had that. And you're like, really? That far back, huh? Well, all right. Well, yeah. good on them. And I'm sure a lot yes. of it was just a fatigue management thing as well for the pilots because you know, you're know talking 11 plus hour missions. That's a long time to be flying an airplane. Co-pilot and a pilot to split that off even a lot. Yeah. So there's, yeah. I can't imagine. I mean, to this day, the longest I flew, I think the longest leg I had was six hours. And that was tiring. I mean, it's just very tiring. It's a lot of fatigue. Yeah. You know, a lot of noise. I mean, that thing, we put a decibel meter in it. You know, it was 140 decibels in cruise. The engines are right there off your ear. Props are right there. And yep. I have the utmost admiration for those guys. I can't say that enough. You know, speaking of noise, previous discussion on that, we asked the question, you know, how loud was it? And, you know, they came back with very loud, obviously. And what do you do to fix it? It's called noise canceling headphones. So I'm assuming that's probably what you guys are sporting up there as well. Some did early on. I was pretty. I'll use the word naive. <laughs> I Fair used enough. the you know, good old David Clark's and yep. my hearing shot. The Mustang was the final nail in the coffin for my ears. Sure. But the B-25 in order of... Magnitude. Intensity, magnitude. Yeah, the, it was the Mustang, the B-25, the 24, and the 17. Okay. 17 is like riding in an RV. <laughs> it's <laughs> loud, but it's you can't talk like you and I are, but you can have a kind of a loud conversation with someone. Yeah. 24 and 25, you can't do that. Yeah. Very good. Well, you have been a great sport throughout everything today. All the technical challenges leading up to our chat as well, but we've learned a lot. I've learned a lot for sure. Again, I'm not a smart man when it comes to B24. So I appreciate everything that, that you've brought to the table, but is there anything that you can think of that we might have missed that the listeners should know, or you think is important to tell about the story of the B24? You know, they build 18,000 of these things. I think at last count, complete and partial airframes, there's only 13 in the world. Wow. You know, the CAF, they operate an LB30, B24A that they give rides in. I encourage everyone, you know, if Collings uh, actually comes back online, I encourage everyone to uh, take a ride in one if they get a chance or at least crawl through one. It'll give you a new perspective on the war and what these guys, the combat conditions these guys had to fight in. You know, there's no very little armor in the airplanes. There's no place to hide. There's no foxhole to jump in. You're exposed. You're exposed to flak. You're exposed to fighters. And when you go through them or fly in them, you realize how thin the aluminum is that's between you and the Almighty. Or It's just an amazing experience to actually physically be around one. And like I said, there aren't that many that are accessible to the public to the inside. So if you see one, take a look and just appreciate what these guys did. That's well said. I love doing this and getting to talk with folks that have flown it, have done the kind of the education, right? The flying education, the static education in whatever form or fashion that takes. And uh, so Jim, thank you for uh, your time. And obviously you got paid to be there. You got the joy of actually flying and operating the aircraft. So you got your own reward in that respect. But I think at least from my vantage point, a lot of that, and I can see the emotion on your face because we have the advantage of video here, but the appreciation for history for, again, like you said, what the veterans had to go through in combat is really what we want to be able to pass on and make others understand and appreciate that as well. So Jim, thank you so much. And why don't we uh, wrap it up? We'll send it back to the studio for uh, the end of Bomber Month uh, 2021. Thanks so much, Jim. Thank you for having me. This has been great to talk about and, and relive and yeah, go over again. It brings back a lot of fond memories and it's been a great time.
Welcome back, everyone. My thanks again to Jim for spending the last hour with me talking about the Liberator. Man, what a fun interview that was. And just getting to talk to him was really, really great. And after I did get to re-listen to it during the, our editing process, it was just so full of great information in and amongst all the awesome stories and experiences that he had flying the Liberator in and amongst all the other aircraft that he's gotten to experience flying. So very fortunate to get to speak with him. And, you know, there was a sneaky aircraft that he kind of brushed over and I didn't mention or highlight as a uh, emphasis point during the interview that he was able to fly. So I'm looking forward to uh, hopefully getting to uh, discuss that down the road. And if you're uh, paying attention to what I'm talking about, it's got two engines and it goes a little bit faster than uh, all of your prop driven aircraft out there, but what a blast, Jim. Thanks again so much. I really appreciate your uh, time with us, but as usual, all good things must come to an end. And so it is with bomber month, 2021 as well. Now, we hope everyone enjoyed it this year. We always have fun doing it, and we look forward to more theme months in the future. So keep an ear out for those, and we'll hope to bring you something more fun and interesting in the year ahead. But thanks to all of you for listening. We appreciate you all and all of the energy and excitement that you bring with listener questions and everything that you submit to us. A huge happy holidays to everyone once again. Jello and I will be back for end of year wrap-up special on the 31st. But until then, get high, get fast and do some good work. We'll see ya. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BVR Productions. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content, check out our Patreon page. Please like, follow, and subscribe to the show. And don't forget to share us with your network. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the host and his guest and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components or its contractors.